All right, hello, welcome everybody. Uh, to, this is the Core DNS intro and deep dive. So um, I'm John Bellameric, uh, and one of the core maintainers of Core DNS. And with me is Yang Tang. Yeah, uh, my name is Yang Tang. I'm from Vivanti. I'm also one of the maintainers of Core DNS. Okay, yeah, so uh, let, let me continue. <laughs> okay, so, okay, yeah, in, first of all, thanks for everyone for joining this session. It's uh, glad to see everyone is coming here, and uh, especially since it's uh, COVID times. So, so I think it's still tough, life is still tough, but I think uh, we all seeing the end of the tunnel to, of this uh, COVID period. So hopefully everyone has a better life you know, moving forward, right? Uh, in today's meeting, uh, in today's session, we are going to discuss about core DNS. Uh, we are going to do two things. First of all, we are going to discuss about uh, doing a little bit of introduction in core DNS, uh, discuss about the latest update in core DNS and several things related to core DNS community. And then I'm going to hand over to John. John will do a deep dive on core DNS and uh, some of the things that we want to discuss, so if you are truly interested in Core DNS, want to make some contributions, or even write some like uh, special plugins for Core DNS, then certainly that's going to be your chance to learn a little bit. Hopefully you'll enjoy this session. Okay, uh, so first of all, just in case you're not very familiar, I'm going to uh, give you a little background on Core DNS. So what is Core DNS? Uh, Core DNS is a flexible DNS server it's written in Go. Uh, initially, it started as a, as a fork of a Caddy HTTP, and then I think in, in 2016, right? That's, uh, that's when CoreDNS project was started. Initially, Mick Gibbon, he contributed to the majority of the original code for CoreDNS to make the Caddy uh, server to, he actually made a fork of Caddy HTTP server and uh, transformed that Cat the HTTP server into a DNS server, and that's why it was originally originally named as the Cat DNS. And then over the years, uh, with uh, different uh, contributions from so many contributors, uh, so many uh, so many members from the community, uh, Core DNS uh, gradually evolved into one of the best pr uh, best DNS server around the world. And uh, most notably, Core DNS has now became the default DNS server for Kubernetes. That's why we are here because that's a Kubicon. So we discuss about Core DNS. But uh, at its core, uh, Core DNS is still a DNS server uh, from, from the beginning. And Core DNS is very much uh, uh, different from other DNS servers. You know, we, are, we all know the bind, like a DNS server or bind, and uh, there are some other uh, DNS servers. But the difference between Core DNS and other DNS servers is that Core DNS has a focus on server discovery. Uh, and also, Core DNS has a very special architecture that's uh, that is actually the, it's a plugin based architecture, which means it can be easily extended. If you want to, uh, let's say if you, you, you want to have some features uh, and you cannot find, find the support from Core DNS, as long, as long as you know how to write Go, you can easily write this feature uh, for yourself. And that in fact, uh, as later, later today, uh, John will walk through some of the plugins, and you can find out how easy it is to imp implement a plugin just for your usage, as long as you know how to write in Go, right? Uh, okay, so coding itself supports uh, uh, different protocols. Coding support uh, uh, a DNS, DNS over TOS, DNO, DNS over HTTP and HTTP2, and the DNS over gRPC. The DNS over gRPC is not a true DNS standard, but it's more like a customer implementation. Uh, Core DNS also support a, f a support a, f a feature of forwarding to upstream uh, via DNS over uh, TOS or over gRPC as well. So if you use Core DNS to serve your DNS server, to serve the DNS traffic, which is UDP, and you want to uh, to use Core DNS to query to your upstream DNS server, you actually don't need to always go through DNS or UDP. You can use uh, other features. Uh, you can use uh, 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 transportation through the TCP, through the TOS or gRPC, which is much more reliable. So from that standpoint, you can think of Core DNS is more like a front end uh, to give you the flexibility locally, but as a same time, you can use the, the other communication channels to guarantee its reliability from the uh, data sync up point, point of view. Uh, Core DNS 
also have the integration with uh, different uh, cloud vendors. For example, Cordin has the integration with uh, Rock Phase 3 from, ad, uh, from AWS. Uh, uh, Cordin has uh, integration with uh, Google Cloud DNS and Azure DNS. That's a major cloud vendors. Uh, another thing with uh, CoreDNS is that CoreDNS is uh, fully embedded into the cloud native ecosystem. It has integration with uh, Prometheus, uh, Open Tracing, and OPA, both uh, uh, all of them uh, cloud native project. Uh, of course, as I mentioned before, the biggest feature with CoreDNS is that CoreDNS now is the default uh, DNS server in Kubernetes. So whenever you use Kubernetes, you probably already noticed that uh, there is uh, uh, a pod up and running that's the with the name of CoreDNS, right? Okay, so let's uh, let uh, okay, so let's get through some of the recent update since last year. The this slide just shows the CoreDNS update. Uh, since last KubeCon, that's uh, later last year in North America. Uh, since late last year, we released uh, several versions in CoreDNS from 1.8.5 to 1.9.2. The latest version is 1.9.2, has been released just 10 days ago, uh, this month, uh, 10 days ago in May 2022. Uh, over the, over the past half a year or so, uh, two plugins has been added. One is the GLIP plugin, which allows you to report where the query comes from, so which is a very nice feature that has been requested by, uh, by the community, and we finally bring this uh, plugin into the default coding as uh, uh, plugin system. We also have uh, added another plugin called the header plugin, which allows you to fiddle with uh, Header bits of your DNS query message. Uh, the releases uh, in CoreDNS over the past half a year also consist of uh, a couple of backward incompatible changes. So, if you ever want to update your DNS server, you may need to pay close attention. One thing is uh, in Kubernetes, we remove the, remove the wildcard query functionality. This may have some impact uh, in your usage in CoreDNS, but we feel like this is very much needed for security reasons. Another thing that's uh, slightly related to security is, uh, is that in Graphics 3 plugin, we also remove the ability to pass the plain text secret in core file. In the past, uh, uh, it's possible to, pa to just, uh, uh, just pass the secret and uh, write down in the core file and save the core file locally. But in recently, in one security audit, it was uh, revealed by the audit that uh, this is, may not be the best practice from a security uh, point of view. So we finally decided to say, let's uh, remove this, uh, uh, remove the plain text secret saving in core file. So that, that also means if you ever use this feature before, <laughs> you have to find some other ways. For example, you can pass the secret through the event variable, which is much safer uh, in, from a security standpoint. Uh, we, we talk about security, of course, I'm going to go through several security fixes as well, but one thing uh, I also want to touch base, that's, uh, that's about the coordinates uh, 1.9.1. Some people may notice that the Golang uh, 1.17.6 actually consists of several security vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. That in impacts a lot of software, not just coordinates. <laughs> also, if you ever use eStill or ever use uh, some of the uh, software is built by Golang. You'll notice uh, if you ever use a vulnerability scanner, you probably notice that uh, <laughs> your vulnerability scanner just reported quite a few things recently, right? That's actually related to Golang 1.17.6. And because of that, in including as 1.9.1, which was released just a couple months ago, we did an emergency update to bring the Golang uh, version to 1.17.8 to fix this vulnerability. So again, for the security purpose, if you ever have a coding server, you probably want to update to the latest one as soon as possible. Okay. So we, we talk about the security. Of course, for the past year or so, the security has been the focus. Uh, not just for CoreDNS, but for the whole software industry. You know, especially if we think about like uh, in early 2021, 
before talking about the ransom attacks, and then later we talk about log 4 g Both both of those events uh, has been like epic in in terms of news updates. Like uh, people just receive those uh, those news even from CNN, from some of the news channels. People talking about the log 4 g ransom attacks. So that's why the security has been a focus for t for the whole 2021. And uh, and for coding us, we actually uh, complete a security audit. This security audit uh, has been done recently in March 2022. Uh, the security audit was uh, done by a third party auditor, that's a trio of bits located in New York. Uh, the event, the security audit event, uh, has been sponsored by Lynch Foundation. So now here I'm going to, to say, okay, thanks a lot for the support from Lynch Foundation and the CNCF to, uh, to allow the coding as to utilize a, a resource that's available to us, so which allows us to making great progress and also helping the community community that's using Cordinas. In this security audit in uh, conducted by Trail Bits, uh, there, there, there are a total of 14 security issues discovered, but I do want to say we only found, um, there is only one high uh, severity severity issue. This is related to a potential uh, potential cash poisoning attack. Uh, there is also another medium medium issue related to the usage of uh, plain text, uh, pl saving plain text in the core files. Uh, but this medium issue reported, it's actually not so much of critical because. Uh, Again, it's possible to mitigate the issue, even if you don't update your server. But the rest of the issue discovered by uh, the rest of issue discovered by trail bits are all related to informational or low-level severity. So we feel like uh, core DNS is very much a safe DNS server. So no. Uh, and all the issues f for now has been resolved. So if you ever uh, have a coding server that's running less than 1.9.1, you should consider updating the coding to latest version, uh, ideally in 1.9.2, because that 1.9.2 uh, fix all the security issues reported by trial bit, as well as the uh, Golang uh, 1.17.6 issue I mentioned just early. The, the whole report uh, is available and we posted on the we post it on the coding as a repo. Uh, if you ever have any interest, you can certainly take a look. Uh, but all the issues have been uh, resolved as of now. So you can just use coding as the latest version to avoid any potential security issues. Okay, another thing I want to discuss is about the coding community. Of course, uh, uh, the growth of coding is always associated with the growth of community. At the moment, we have 300 contributors. Uh, big thanks to everyone who contributed to coding S. We have 26 maintainers. That's a pretty big number as well. And we also have 32 public adopters. If, by the way, if anyone uh, in this room, if you ever, you know, if your company or your institution ever use coding S and your company or institution uh, is willing to let your the name to show up, you can certainly create a PR in coding as a repo to add your company or institution to the public adopt list. That, by, by the way, by itself will add you to be, uh, you will become a contributor just by adding this you know, entry, right? Uh, we also have 9,200 stars, so we are hoping to reach uh, uh, 10,000 uh, 10, stars very soon. So let's see when we can uh, get uh, reach to this goal. Uh, and also another thing I want to mention is that for the past uh, five years or so, CoDNS has been uh, participating in two programs. One is the Linux Foundation's uh, LFX community program, which helps uh, the students to work on open source. In return, students will receive a, a small amount of money uh, in return, which uh, it's going to help financially. And also, we participate in Google Summer Code. Uh, both program has been running for quite several years, and we participate almost every year for the past five years. Uh, this year, there's another project that's actually the uh, 
ACME support for certificate management. Uh, this project has been uh, accepted by Google Summer Code, so there is a student that's currently working on this project. So hopefully we can see the uh, see the completion of the project and uh, and hopefully you know hopefully that can bring this nice feature to the community as well. Uh, again, just uh, just one more thing, just want to mention that if uh, we plan uh, coding as plan to continue to participate in uh, both Linux Foundation program as well as the Google Summer Code in the future. So if you ever know any student has an interest in open source community, want to contribute, you can encourage them to uh, send the application every year, and we. Uh, in return, they are going to receive money if they, they can complete the project. Okay, that's right. very much the, the introduction. So I'm going to hand over to John to, to do a deep dive on coding as. Yeah. Thanks, John. Hi, everybody. Um, <laughs> so um, we have about 20 minutes left. Before I jump into this, I want to ask a few questions, know how much time I should spend on different parts of this. So. How many of you are using uh, Kubernetes and Core DNS in Kubernetes? Probably almost all of you. Okay, <laughs> awesome. And then how many of you are using Core DNS without Kubernetes? Just nothing to do with Kubernetes. Okay, hey, we've oh, got a few. Nice. Awesome. Um, great. Well, so what, what uh, I'm going to talk about a little bit are how you could customize Core DNS. Now, for most of you in the audience who are using Core DNS as part of Kubernetes, you're probably not going to want to do this, but there's few of you who raised your hands. We'll talk about it, but I'll try to be a little bit brief so we leave a good amount of time for Q&A um, around, since most of you in the audience uh, might not be too keen on this stuff. But as, as Yang said, one of the really great things about Core DNS that's different from traditional DNS servers, most of them, is, is, is the, this plugin architecture. And the idea is that, that we use a, a sort of request processing pipeline. So a DNS request comes in, the server unpacks it and just hands it to this pipeline. And when you're setting up your core file, which is your configuration file for Core DNS, you are just enabling different um, plugins within that pipeline, configuring them to tweak the request in whatever way you want. And so uh, that extent, that plugin architecture lends itself to extensibility, and that's what we're talking about here. So th there's three basic ways to extend it. The simplest way is to enable an external plugin. So we have plugins that come with your standard Core DNS that all of you running are, in Kubernetes, are running in your Kubernetes because whoever your provider is built it and, or they pulled it from our Docker, um, our Docker Hub. But if you wanted to do something fancier like, I don't know, back your, um, your Core DNS in memory cache with a layer two Redis cache, we have, a, we have a, uh, uh, an external plugin for that. Or um, there's a whole host of them. Um, and you don't even need to know how to use Go to do this. Uh, they are written in Go, but it's actually super, super simple. There are a couple of really important things, though, to note. Um, plugins are not loaded dynamically. They're built, they're done at compile time, build time. And uh, the plugin ordering is fixed at compile time. So that processing of that request through that pipeline, you can't change the order of that without rebuilding Core DNS, which kind of sucks. But doing something about it is challenging for a variety of reasons. So this is probably the most accessible way to do it. Um, and your, all your prerequisites are is Docker and a shell. So simple things, you clone it, you modify the plugin CFG. That tells it what plugins to compile into Core DNS and in what order. And then you, you build it. So I'm not going to step through it because we don't have time for that, but I'll, I, or I'm not going to actually do it on a shell, but it actually really is quick and easy. So you clone Core DNS. If you pull this PDF down off of the, the Sketch website, you can just copy and paste this right out of there, paste it in your shell. Um, CD into that directory, open plugin CFG. So what you'll see in plugin CFG is colon delimited, li colon delimited, delimited list, I can't speak, um, the first word is the directive. That's the word that will appear in your core file when you configure that plugin. And then the Go module that implements that plugin. This list is a little bit out of date because uh, we, we forked Caddy, so it shouldn't say mholt there. Um, and then you build it. We have a Docker image um, 
oh yeah, you, can, you run this Docker command, builds it, it emits your accordion as binary, and you're done. All right. Second way, accordion as a library. So here what you're doing is in, instead of um, actually uh, running the accordion as binary itself, you're embedding CordianS in another binary. You can use this to strip out plugins you don't care about. Mm -hmm. So how many of you, if you know, use the node local DNS feature in, in Kubernetes? Okay, a couple of you. So th that project uses this technique. So essentially, um, the node local DNS, which all of you should be using it, by the way, because it's much, much better. What it does is it runs a little mini CordianS just for caching on every node and it redirects all the DNS requests from that node to that local cache. And then for any requests that need to go to the core central cluster DNS, it upgrades the connection to TCP, which fixes some kernel bugs and issues and race conditions. So um, how many of you know, have any idea about what I just said as far as DNS? <laughs> like, like, you understand, okay. Uh, hopefully, hopefully, you can look that up and it'll get through. Um, but yeah, so essentially, if you have DNS issues in Kubernetes, weird DNS issues, try node local DNS because there's, there's kernel issues, there's race conditions, there's contract filling up with UDP, there's all sorts of subtle things that can happen under load that that fixes. Anyway, it uses this technique. Um, and uh, I have an example you can pull off of GitHub, super easy to, to build. Um, I, along with, um, I don't know if you know who Cricket Lou is, he wrote a bunch of the DNS books, DNS and Bind and all of these things. He and I wrote a core DNS book and we go through this example there. So, um, you know, you can go buy the book too, that would be great. Um, all right, third way, I've used six minutes, we'll, we'll, leave ten, we'll use four more minutes for the last one. Mm -hmm. um, so, write your own plugin. So remember, we have the pipeline, Request comes in, we do something with it. Um, what do we do with it? Well, we tend to classify plugins into three categories. This is not strictly necessary. This is just sort of a best practice we use because what we want, like a Unix pipeline, we want each of those plugins to be composable. We want you to be able to use them with the other plugins. So we want to kind of scope them to some, some um, small piece of, of functionality so you can pull them into, you know, as an external plugin, pull it into different Cordian instances and things. So when you decide to write a plugin, you should think about, am I writing a backend plugin? A backend plugin means I'm a source of data. The Kubernetes plugin, which you're all, most of you are using, is actually a backend plugin. It's pulling data from the Cube API server and publishing it as D DNS. The Cloud DNS, uh, the, the Route 53 one, all the same thing. They read from those cloud provider APIs and then they present the data as DNS. Those are backends. There's also backends, like external backends for storing your DNS names in uh, Postgres, for example. Um, mutators. Mutators are things that muck with the request. They do something to it. They change it. Um, they deny it. So uh, we have a rewrite plugin that lets you, uh, somebody queries for, you know, um, well, you know, some, some name, we look at that name and we say, ha ha, we don't really want you to go there. We're gonna rewrite the query and we're gonna send it to the upstream name server as something different and then we're gonna reply with that IP address. So that's what rewrite is for. And um, actually that makes me, uh, something I'm not sure if Young mentioned, Core DNS is a authoritative DNS server. So in DNS, there's authoritative servers and recursive servers. When you, um, a recursive server takes a DNS request, and it breaks it down into the labels, and it goes out to each of those other DNS servers and figures out uh, which name server owns that particular domain. So when you look up foo.google.com, your local recursive server will go, I don't know anything about foo.google.com. I'm not authoritative. I don't have those records. So I'm going to ask, I'm going to figure out what name server does have those. And I, you know, so it's going to say, okay, well, maybe it's the google.com one. Well, I don't know anything. What's Google? I don't know what that is. So I'm going to go to the .com, right? I'm going to go to the root name server, and I'm going to sort of walk that whole tree. So that's a recursive name server, and it's not what CoreDNS does. That means that unless you're resolving, using CoreDNS to resolve the names it owns, um, 
or that it's pulling from some other back-end source, um, it's going to need an, out, uh, an, out, uh, uh, an external name server that it can forward its request to. So if you're looking at your core file and you see the forward plugin, that's all that does. So just something to keep in mind um, when, you're, when you're using Core DNS. It's a, it's a huge limitation, frankly, but it's, uh, it's there for a reason because recursive DNS servers are really hard to write, and um, you know, so, so we haven't done it. Anyway, um, mutators, uh, that's where we implement ACLs, cache, rewrite, things like that. Finally, configurators, if that's a word, um, are just things that modify the state of Kubernetes, or of Core DNS, rather. So um, the bind plugin tells you which uh, IP addresses to bind to. The log plugin tells you what kind of logs to, to, to do, things like that. So think about your plugin that you want to write as one of these. Then you just implement four functions. Um, these are the mandatory ones. Of course, your logic is going to have to live in some function somewhere. Um, the name function, super simple. Uh, the serve DNS function, that's the meet that takes the, the, uh, the request in and um, does something with it. So our example, I've used up all my time, but I'll, I'll go quick. Um, again, this is out there on the core DNS um, organization in GitHub. You can step through this, it's, it's super easy. But basically, there's a, a plugin here that I've written um, as an example that will take a response. When you, when you get the response from, say, the upstream name server or the, the a later plugin in the chain, it looks at the response and it consolidates a given type of record into one. Um, so, Super simple, like I said, name function, just returns the name. Setup registers the plugin with the parsing routines so that, uh, so that when we're parsing the core file, we know what you're referring to when you use that directive. Uh, I'm just going to, well, no, actually, this is important. The, it also does this add plugin, and this is what inserts it in the chain. So in that setup, in that plugin CFG, Basically, when we, when, we, um, uh, when we read the core file, we're not looking at the order the directives come in in order to initialize all of these chains. We're actually running through a fixed order. That's why, why you, you have that issue I talked about earlier. All right. And um, I'm, I'm just going to, because I, I want to leave time. Oh, boy. Sorry, Young. Oh, it did come up. No, it didn't come up. I'm going to skip showing you that um, in the interest of time and leaving time for Q&A. But you can check out the serve DNS uh, uh, on GitHub. Like I said, super easy. Just takes in a request, modifies it. The one thing I will tell you is, um, well, how about this? I'll tell you, contact me afterwards if you want to do this, and I'll go through it with you in detail because I want to leave you guys time to talk. All right. So some resources then for, um, for uh, any of you out there who are interested in learning more about it or, or diving into actually modifying Core DNS, this is where you can find us online. Uh, we have a Slack channel. It's not the Kubernetes Slack. It's the CNCF Slack. Um, we have a Slack channel on there. And um, of course, GitHub is the main place where you can reach us. That's where we're most active. Um, there is a mailing list, but we don't use it almost at all. We will get the emails and reply to you, but nobody uses it, so I don't even think we put it up there. But uh, um, mostly Slack and, and GitHub. All right. So questions. Yes, sir, here. We've got a um, microphone here. Yeah, my question is about uh, PTR and A records. I know services, uh, Core DNS is quite consistent, but pod, uh, it seems that sometimes you get PTR records, reverse DNS for pods, and sometimes you don't. And I see on GitHub some people saying that, oh, that should never, ever work, which I actually personally agree with, but my, my users like it, that it works. <laughs> yeah. Um... Let me think about, let me try to remember. Um, so when you do a, um, when, 
when you do a headless service, I believe you will get PTR records for the pods backing that service. Um, I, I actually wrote that, well, I, I, I wrote that specification, reverse engineering it from kubedns, um, but it was a few years ago, so I would have to dig into the details. But yeah, they're, they're generally, um, I believe you get them for headless services. For cluster IP services, they don't really make sense. Um, and for pods themselves, we don't have uh, A records for pods and unless you have a headless service. And the reason for that is um, really uh, twofold. One is that from a, a sort of philosophical point of view, um, we don't really want you thinking about pods. And, you know, that's a little heavy-handed. You actually, we, you can have pod records. I'll get to that in a second. But um, you al we also, um, from a performance reasons, is really the main reason. So if you think about what CoreDNS does in a Kubernetes context, CoreDNS sits and listens on the Kube API server. So every time that uh, a service, uh, or now in modern ones, the endpoint slice is actually what backs a service. Whenever an endpoint slice, a pod comes or goes from an endpoint slice, we're updating the cache within CoreDNS. So we're watching and we're seeing all these events come down um, from the API server. If we subscribe to pods too, it's way more traffic and it's way more load on the API server. So in general, um, we don't want to do that. And so that's why you won't see PTR records for pods, only for pods that are endpoints in, in headless services. So why would I come Probably because those pods participate. Well, it would be by the service name. Um, I don't know, we can dig into it later. You won't see them for raw pods. It's got to have a service backing it in order for it to have any PTR record at all. Now, in a stateful set, if these pods are participating in a stateful set, they're going to they're gonna have that service created automatically. So that might also be where you would see them. But sometimes, where reversal comes from the DNS, also the Reversal comes from the IP of the pod. I get the services DNS address yes. sometimes. You'll get the P, you'll get the P, yes. When you look up the IP of the pod, yeah. you'll get the DNS name of the headless service that's, yeah. that that pod is backing. Of course, if there's more than one, I don't know what we do. Yeah, and um, restarting, sometimes I've seen restarting the core DNS server makes it appear. And that shouldn't be the case, but okay. we can maybe talk offline if, and see if somebody else has a question. Any other questions? Hello. Um, is it possible as a policy to uh, forbid a Kubernetes namespace from querying entry of uh, services in other namespace? Can we write this kind of policy? Sorry. I, I'm sorry, I couldn't so, follow so, it. So, sorry. Maybe we can ask. Yeah. 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 Is it possible to uh, write a policy to say that a Kubernetes namespace cannot uh, make DNS request ah. to know about services in other namespace? OK. There is a, um, an external plugin yeah. called, well, at one point in the Kubernetes plugin, we had a configurable option for, I believe, naming specific namespaces for which we produce records. Yeah. But I'm not sure if we had one for excluding them. We would have to check. Yeah. But we do have a policy external plugin. That's the one I was showing. We called it Firewall was a directive, but policy is the plugin that lets you do, um, do a little more with that. Um, but that's certainly a very feasible um, functionality to add. Where I'm hesitant is I don't want to add a bunch of stuff to Kubernetes. It's already got a bazillion options, that plugin. But we can potentially use it to do it with the, um, with, with the policy plugin. Come talk to me afterwards. We'll take a look. So my question is, like, we <clears throat> use a lot of uh, external services in our cluster. And because of how n dots work and the way the uh, search uh, search works, we end up making a lot of uh, queries. And we can see that NX domain errors. So yes. is there a way to uh, make sure that for a regex, a particular regex like Azure or something, we can um, 
make the code in a little bit smarter so that it doesn't search for those domains? Okay, okay so, so you're saying like uh, you have concerns with coding as if coding is constantly occurring, let's say back in like a, a drill, like a Google Cloud or Office 3, is that a question? Yes, so we make unnecessary DNS requests because of how n dots work. <laughs> okay, okay, so, so first, first, thing, first of all, I want to mention one thing, you know, like uh, DNS, everyone knows DNS is simple, so okay, it's DNS protocol, just UDP, what's the always say? But the DNS is one very important feature. DNS is massively scalable. Your whole internet is because it supports the whole internet, right? That's a lot of people talk about distributed systems. They didn't realize that DNS by itself is a distributed system. How DNS is able to handle that? DNS, when it supports the internet, it's through caching at different levels. So you do need the caching, right? That, and, and also that's one thing, that's one thing is the caching. Another thing is the reliable translation at the different, uh, no, cache levels. For example, uh, that's why we, we mentioned about uh, DNS over TOS, DNS over gRPC, and why we mentioned about uh, connecting to DNS to, let's say, Azure with, uh, with uh, Azure API because that's going to be more reliable. But caching is the most important thing. Like when we talk about yeah, no local no cache. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah no, no local cache will probably help with that because it caches the negative responses. I think what you're talking about is the search list. So in, in DNS, yeah. The client-side resolver sitting yeah. on your node or in your pod, okay. um, where, when, you, when you ask for, for, for uh, say, google.com, okay. the Kubernetes has configured a, um, a list of names that it tries, because you didn't qualify fully with a dot on the end. So the first thing is, if you control those names, just put a dot on the end, and the problem goes away. Okay. But you can't really get people to do that because people don't do it. <laughs> so we, have, we actually implemented a feature a few years ago specifically to, to address this problem. Um, there's some gotchas with it, though. First of all, it means you need, to, um, you need to watch pods. Because in order to make it work, we have to figure out which namespace the pod making the request is in in order to understand its search path. And so, um, and there's a race condition. If the pod comes up and we don't get notified fast enough about the pod, then internally we can run into a problem where we can't preemptively figure out your search path. So it, it's, it's a, a less than perfect solution um, to that problem. The node local DNS cache probably will help you because I believe it will cache those negative responses so they will never leave the machine. They'll never leave the node. But um, yeah, it, it's unfortunately, not a fully solved problem, um, and uh, you know, that's probably your best option. Okay. I think we're out of time. I mean, I'm willing to do one more question if people have one, but I think that's it. All right. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Okay. Thanks, guys.